If you haven't had a chance to watch our previous episode, you might want to go back and do that because in that episode, we, we saw the seventh seal opened, and then there were seven angels who were given seven trumpets who were going to start dishing out some of these judgments of God. And, and we made it through the first four trumpets, and in this episode, we, uh, we're going to go through the fifth and sixth trumpets. And Ken, from what I've seen and, and what I've heard this chapter be dubbed by some is, all hell is breaking loose. Mm. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And in fact, that's, that's a very literal way of stating it. Um, let me give a quick overview of where we are in our, our, uh, our passage. By the way, just a quick reminder, I, I thought of this the other day. Remember, at the beginning of our study, we gave a, a challenge to read through the book of Revelation once a week. And I wonder if you're, if you're continuing to do that, if you just put that in the comments and say, hey, I'm still doing it. Remember, we want the goal of this is to make the book of Revelation a part of our Bible again. It doesn't need to be an alien book. We should use the same interpretive rules in Revelation that we do in the book of Ephesians or the book of Judges. It's part of our 66 books. It's not an alien book. It should be treated the same way as the rest of the Bible. So that's what we're attempting to do. Just a quick overview. Remember, chapter one was the preamble. This is the Lord saying, this is who I am. Chapters two and three is the historical narrative. It basically says, this is how we got to this point. Four through seven is the ethical stipulations. Remember, this is now the covenant lawsuit. This is not just reading a legal document for the future. This is actually saying this is what you did do. And for those of you who obeyed, the ethical stipulations results in seeing the Lord high and lifted up. If you did not obey the ethical stipulations of the Mosaic Covenant, this is saying this is your big fault. This is what you did incorrectly with the with the covenant. And now I am high and lifted up and you're in huge trouble. That's the next section is the sanctions in 8 through 14. And that's where we are in this in chapter 9. This is saying, because you did obey, here's what's going to happen. And if you didn't obey, here's what's going to happen. And so that's where we are in the overview. So uh, don't get bogged down in the details of this. I know this is a lot of information, especially because this may be a new way of, of approaching the book of Revelation for many of you. Please don't get bogged down in the details. The simplicity of this is that Adam had dominion. He forfeited it to Satan. Dominion over what? Dominion over the people of the earth, the nations. The word Gentiles is nations in the Old Testament. Jesus came to, uh, to redeem mankind, and he took back, he stole back the nations from Satan. And we're seeing the, the clash of this happening right now. So Satan's kingdom is being defeated in the first century, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And, and Jesus is offering salvation to the world. So for the 40 years between the ascension of Christ and the destruction of the temple, we have the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is simply a record of the growth of the church by early on by Jews and then later by Gentiles and the persecution of the followers of Christ as the gospel begins to spread during those 40 years. And it's going to culminate with the Romans coming from the north and and having a war with the Jews, uh, we can read a, a, a historical commentary on this by uh, the works of Josephus in the Jewish-Roman War. And so what we're looking at in the book of Revelation is a, is a comfort and a warning to the seven churches which were in Asia Minor. This is modern-day Turkey when we talk about Turkey. And it's comforting them to know that although there's going to be a civil war in Rome, there's going to be a civil war in Jerusalem, and there's going to be absolute uh, tyranny from Rome all the way crushing those that are in the city walls to be comforted that this is all part of the plan for the Lord to use Rome as his spanking tool, as his punishing rod for the apostate Jews that transgress the covenant from the law of Moses. So what we're doing in our studies, we're just simply connecting the dots with the warnings that were given and what actually happened uh, in the first century. Now, as we're getting started in this, Jimmy, I think the the mind-blowing part of this study is that once, once you get a hold of what Revelation is about, and once you get a hold of the ministry purpose of Christ, you almost want to go back again and start rereading the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and read all these parables that maybe at one time some of his parables were kind of a head-scratcher, but now that you're getting your head wrapped around how to think biblically— how to, how to use the Bible to define the Bible. 
And once you can do that, you, you'll actually have a lot of fun going back and starting over again at the book of Matthew. And in fact, uh, that's something that we're doing at our church at True Grace. We're going back through and we're going ma- doing Matthew verse by verse. And I'll tell you, uh, it's almost as if you've never read it before, if you're going back with new eyes and understanding some of these things. In fact, there is a parable we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45, just these three verses. And this simple three verse commentary will actually give us our understanding of Revelation 9, 1 through 12. It'll actually give us an understanding. So let's go ahead and turn there and start there. If we can understand what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 12, then we're going to certainly understand Revelation 9 because it's the same context. Matthew chapter 12 and verses 43 through 45, uh, Jesus says this, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he came, uh, when he come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. Notice Jesus says, even so it shall be to this wicked generation. So whatever he's talking about with these unclean spirits, it's going to be done to this evil generation that Jesus is speaking to. If we can get a hold of what he's saying here, Revelation 9 will be a breeze. What is he saying here? Let me give an illustration, Jimmy. This is probably the best illustration I can give. Um, Let's do a hypothetical for you and me here. Um, I've given this illustration before. I can't really improve on it. Maybe I can one day, but let's, let's just say that you and I were um, influenced. Now, for this illustration, you're going to have to really use your imagination, okay? Uh, because I'm going to say in this illustration that the U.S. government is uh, holy and righteous. So <laughs> you, use your imagination, okay? Uh, so let's just assume that for the sake of the illustration. And let's say that you and I were influenced by a wicked regime. Uh, a tyrannical, um, wicked, wicked uh, outside force from the U.S., and they talk you and I into overthrowing the U.S. government. Let's just say. So you and I go in. We have and we we buy into it, and we take our our whole life dedicated to throwing out the U.S. government. So we go and we actually overtake the White House. We clean it out, um, and um, we get rid of them. And we're standing in the Oval Office, and we say, "We did it! I can't believe we did it! We did it!" And then we go to those that talked us into that, and we turn around expecting high fives and expecting hugs, and they see us, and they are ready to destroy us. The people that talked us into it are ready to destroy us. And we say, what are you doing? I I thought you guys wanted us to do this for you. And they looked at us, and they said, you're a useful idiot, aren't you? You're a great fool. You did our dirty work for us. So the very people who would have protected us, remember the U.S. government in the illustration is righteousness, the very people who would have protected us are not in the White House anymore. The Department of Defense, we defeated them. They're gone. Their presence is not there. The very people who would have protected us from them aren't there. So they devour us and say, thanks for doing our dirty work. You guys are a bunch of morons. I can't believe you didn't see that coming. This is the parable that Jesus is talking about. When we're getting into Revelation 9, here's the simplicity of it. The presence of God always dwells with his people. The presence of God always dwells in his father's house, the temple, the tabernacle. Once his presence was kicked out, which is what the Pharisees wanted, they wanted Jesus out. Once they destroyed Jesus and Jesus died on the cross, they started high-fiving each other. We got rid of him. Well, guess what? When you get rid of heaven's presence, you open up the floodgates for hell to now come in. If that concept makes sense, Revelation 9 is going to be a breeze. Let's go ahead and look at Revelation 9 in verse number 1. The Bible says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth. And to him, that is to the star, was given the key of the bottomless pit couple of things as we're getting started here. Notice this star that fell is probably, um, this star is probably Satan himself. In fact, 
Uh, this is very common language throughout the New Testament of, of Satan being kicked out of heaven. We're going to do a lot more on this when we get into act number two in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12, we'll see a more descriptive uh, war that's going on in heaven and kicking Satan out. But for right now, we're going to see this star that's kicked out of heaven and he falls from heaven onto the earth. And to him was given. I want you to notice that a key was given to him. And the key is given to him uh, of the bottomless pit. Now, there's a lot of imagery going on here. So let's just kind of talk through some of this. One, we have a key is given to him. And we also notice that the key is to the abyss. The bottomless pit, the word here is abyss. Let's talk through the word abyss for just, just a moment. The word abyss appears seven times in the book of Revelation. And this is this is one of those hidden sevens. You know, we see the seven is in Revelation as completeness or completion and seven is is the number of the words abyss now this is the same word let's go ahead and look at genesis chapter two in verse uh chapter one i'm sorry in verse number two so this is should be familiar to all of us and and uh, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep there's the word abyss exact same word the word deep here and the word abyss is the same word yeah, and we're talking about in the, in the original language. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So you see, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2, you begin to learn a principle in the Bible. And that is that where God's Spirit is not is called this abyss. And we start seeing this pattern throughout the Bible where we have the abyss, the place of the deep, um, bottomless pit, is the absence of God. Notice in Genesis chapter 1, that it says darkness was upon the face of the deep, the abyss, and then God's spirit moved upon the waters. And then we see things starting to move with God's spirit. So this idea of abyss is really talking about the absence of God's presence. It is the opposite of heaven. It's the opposite of righteousness. This is, uh, as you stated in the beginning, this would be our you know, our understanding of what we think of as hell. The abyss here is the, uh, is, is the abode of the king of the wicked people. You know, this, this is the star that was fallen, and he was given this, this key to open up this, this lack of God's presence area. Let's go ahead and look at what Jesus said about this in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. When Jesus is speaking uh, concerning this idea of overthrowing Satan, he does this in the context of, of stealing back the nations. Luke chapter 10 and verses 17 through 19. This is the context of the 70, verse 17. The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said, he said unto them, he said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon on serpents and scorpions. Notice the connection to serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So in this, in this little passage in Luke chapter 10, we have a lot. We have Satan falling as lightning falling from heaven. We have a scorpion type uh, creature that is going to hurt people, but it's not going to hurt those which the Lord has sealed. Look at what it says in verse number uh, 19. Behold, I, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You're going to be basically stepping on scorpions. You're going to be stepping on snakes, and they won't hurt you. Why? Because I'm more powerful than the enemy. I, I'm in charge of what's going on here. So in Revelation chapter 9, we see this star falling from heaven. And this will, we're going to put a little pin in, in that because we're going to get into, get into that idea of there being no room for Satan anymore in heaven. Once the new covenant kicks in, the accuser of the brethren, the prosecuting attorney, he, he, he no longer has a legal loophole. Men are not involved in the high priesthood anymore. Uh, in the old covenant, Satan had a, a loophole legally that men would do something technically wrong. And he would say, how can you be a just God, a holy God, if somebody did anything wrong in your system of human uh, uh, mediation, the high priesthood, 
if, if, if the high priest did anything wrong or any of the priests did anything wrong, Satan could accuse. Look, you, you cannot justify somebody according to the letter of the law if they did something wrong. Well, once Jesus became the lamb and once he took over the sacrificial system, guess who's out of a job? The accuser of the brethren, because there's no legal loophole anymore. See, there's a lot of legal loopholes in the old covenant. It's, it's weak in that it was made with the uh, obedience of men. But the new covenant has nothing to do with that. The new covenant is the blood of Christ. He is the sacrificial system. He is the prophet. He is the priest. There's no, there's no need for any obedience from mankind. And so there's no place found of the accuser of the brethren. So he's kicked out of heaven. He has no room, no reason to be there. So, Jimmy, what I mean by the obedience of man is not required anymore. I mean for the judicial process in, in, this, in the sense that in the old covenant, we needed the high priest to follow certain steps. In other words, there, were, there was people involved in, in the atoning process for the children of Israel. But now that Christ has done the atoning process, what I mean by that is now the judicial act is solely done. By Christ, just as just as some clarification there. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and move to verse number two, Revelation nine two. It says, "And he that is the one that was the star that fell from heaven and was given the key, he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit." Let's go ahead and. And just wrap our heads around what's going on. So here's here's the big picture in Revelation 9. The big picture is this. God is using the Roman army to be influenced by Satan to judge apostate Israel. That is, if you can just get your head wrapped around that, that is exactly what we're seeing here. So Satan falls from heaven. A key is given to him. We're tying this together with the abyss, the deepness, uh, the place where there's no spirit of God. And then in verse number two, we just simply learn here, he opened up the bottomless pit. So in other words, it's starting. Remember the first four trumpets were on the earth, a third of the grass, a third of the trees. As somebody asked in the comments, I didn't have time to answer. They said something like, you know, help me understand this. I'm not in our last video. They said, I'm not understanding this because when I look at 70 AD, I don't see a third of the trees, a third of the grass and so forth. Well, remember, we're not talking about just 70 AD. We're talking about the, the moments leading up to 70 AD. So we're talking 65, 66, 67. But no, you're not, you're not meant to read Revelation in such a literal wooden sense. You, you, we aren't saying here that if you were at just the right time, you'd see a star fall from heaven. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is these are connections. We call them hyperlinks to understand. These are hyperlinks to the Old Testament, to the rest of the Bible. It's pointing backwards. So our job is to go see what it's connected to, to understand what's being said. And basically what's being said is that Israel has become a new form of Egypt. It's become spiritual Egypt, spiritual Sodom, spiritual Babylon. Israel has become these things. And so when we see a third of the trees, a third of the grass, that should click in our head. Hey, we've seen that before. Where have we seen fractions of trees and grass burnt up? We go back and read that and say, ah, that's the same thing that's happening again. So just to kind of clarify that, in fact— Well, and you did cover that in the last episode. You you took us back to uh, through Ezekiel and a couple of other spots where you're talking about a third and a third. Yes, yes. This this is you know this is a way a method of interpretation and and this isn't something I'm making up. We're following the biblical pattern. Remember at the beginning of this, it said that John is writing this with signs to remember to signify with signs. In fact, this this past Sunday I was teaching our church and I was reminded of Jesus using this hermeneutic in in the book of uh, is it Malachi or Micah? I always get those confused. And I'm reading it. Um, it is in. Um, one of those. <laughs> and Jesus says that Elijah will, it's in Malachi. It's, it's right. It's right at the end. It says, talks about that Elijah will come before, before the Messiah, Elijah will come. If people remember that. So now there's 400 years of silence until the book of Matthew is written and Jesus comes on the scene and Israel's looking for Elijah to come. Now, John the Baptist comes on the scene. He's the one that Malachi was talking about. The Pharisees go to John the Baptist and they ask, are you him? Are you Elijah? Now, John knew what they were talking about. They meant, did, 
Are you Elijah resurrected? Are you the Tishbite? Are you him? And John answers, no, because he knew what they were talking about. In other words, they took Elijah coming from Malachi as a literal wooden, when we say wooden, it means there's no pliability, on the face of its uh, meaning, literal meaning that Elijah would be resurrected. That's what the Pharisees were asking. And John the Baptist says, no, I'm not him. Now, when Jesus in the book of Matthew is talking about John the Baptist, he says, this is Elijah. And then he says to him who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, if you're willing to understand the hermeneutic of how this is written, you're going to get that he's a type of Elijah. He's the last of the prophets. It's not literally Elijah. It's a type of Elijah. And so this is how the Bible is written, but you have to know the markers of what to look for. All right, so we're getting into verse number three. Let's go ahead and look at verse number three. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, there's a lot here. Let's go ahead and, and um, do some cross-references here. In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 28. Genesis 19 and verse 28. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up, as the smoke of a great furnace. We're just connecting some of these themes here. Exodus chapter 19. So when Sodom and Gomorrah is, is burnt up, we see the smoke covering it as a great furnace. Exodus 19 and verse 18. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke thereof ascended with the smoke of a furnace and of the whole, the whole mount quaked greatly. Exodus chapter 10 and verses 12 through 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, and they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail hath left. Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind, you know, that direction east, or the direction the Lord's moving, the east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth. See the hyperbole there. So that the land was darkened, and, and they did eat every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees and the hail had left. There remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field, through all the land of Egypt. So, Jimmy, as we're reading this, our job is to say, we've heard those words before. We know what it means when we start seeing these things happen. We know what it means for locusts. This is a plague. What was God doing in the plague? God was, by the strength of his hand, delivering his people out of bondage from Egypt, from a wicked ruler, Pharaoh. Nothing has changed except for location. Now, Jerusalem has become what Egypt once was, and he's delivering his people, his church, those that are in Christ, out of this situation by a set of plagues. And this time, it's not locusts, but it is the Roman army he's using, and he's telling us that it's being done the exact same way. That's all we're seeing here. That's why the same wording is being used. Joel chapter 1. Joel is a significant book. Um, to understand these things. Joel chapter 1 and verse number 6. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. We could read on in Joel chapter 1. There's a lot there. Let's go to chapter 2 and verses 4 through 10. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like mighty men of war, they shall march every one on his ways, they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. 
They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the horses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Notice it says his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide in it? Now, we could do an exhaustive study, really, in the book of Joel. But what we're learning in the book of Joel is the Lord is using this coming judgment on Jerusalem by the, with the Roman army here. And actually, let's go ahead and I think I have this later in our um, lesson also. But let, this would be a good time to maybe somebody saying, hey, how do, you, how do you know that's talking about this? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 2. And when Peter is speaking on the day of Pentecost, he is talking about this idea of the book of Joel. And some people see this miracle of tongues and they say, man, are you guys drunk? And he goes, no, 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 we're not drunk. We're filled with the spirit. Verse 16, he says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He says this, the day of Pentecost, this moment, this is what Joel was talking about. It shall come to pass in the last days. Now he's quoting Joel. Uh, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all your flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I'll show you wonders in heaven above and the signs of the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's quoting the book of Joel there. Joel says these things are going to happen. Peter says one of the key indicators is God pouring out his spirit upon men in the new covenant. And, and these people are saying, what's going on here? And Peter's saying, guys, pay attention. This is what Joel was talking about. The spirit was just poured out like was promised. And now you're going to start seeing these things come into play. An army is going to come in, sun not giving its light, stars falling from heaven. There's going to be this, what we call cosmic disturbance, or we're going to talk about this in the terms of decreation language is, is a common way of saying this. We're going to start seeing that the Adamic uh, control given to Satan start crumbling down. There's going to be a new creation in Christ. And so we're going to start seeing this terminology all throughout this uh, prophetic book of Joel. So let's go ahead and head back to Revelation 9. So these locusts that are coming up out of the ground, this is sort of a, uh, uh, this is sort of an imagery of, of um, the way that I've kind of heard this described, and it really helped me visually, was if you can imagine the underworld, the deep, the abyss, is kind of like a volcano. And the plug in that volcano is the presence of God, is the temple. Well, Jesus in John chapter 2 was standing in the temple. And he said, I could tear this thing down and rebuild it in three days. Of course, it's, it's one of those wooden, literal uh, mistakes that the people made that were with him. And he was talking about his body, of course, resurrecting in three days, replacing the building. Of course, they, they didn't understand how one person could rebuild a building that took so long and they could just do it in three days. But Jesus was talking about that plugging up of the volcanic, demonic influence of this volcano that's underneath in the abyss. Revelation 9 is basically saying, hey, you guys wanted to remove the presence of God. Remember in Matthew chapter 23 when he says, I leave to you your house desolate. This is the result right here. He said within this generation to Matthew 23, this is the result of leaving that house desolate. You get the abyss. You get the deep. You get these ideas of the underworld, the, 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 the destroyer. Satan is in charge of these things. And now we're seeing the lid being picked up off of the gates of hell. And these locust-like creatures are starting to come out. And this is being done in the form of the Roman army. Let's go ahead and read down. It was given unto them, verse number three, it was given unto them uh, with, with power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And I, I thought this was very interesting. If you like this video, hit that like and subscribe button. And check out the full episode by clicking the link below.